Good morning, everyone. Um, it's nice to see so many of you here. Um, for those of you who are coming into the room, if you'd just like to take a seat as soon as you can, that'd be great. A uh, special welcome to everyone today. There's lots of people in the room. We've got uh, AMP visitors, um, we've got members of the AMP board, welcome, AMP staff, uh, and of course, members of the media. So glad to have you all here. Uh, my name is Lisa Feiland. I'm Head of Product Governance and I work in the uh, Wealth Solutions and Customer Division here at AMP. Uh, I'll be your host for this particular session. So uh, I'll shortly be introducing our, our speaker. Um, but before I get underway, just very quickly, I've been asked to uh, cover off just a few quick housekeeping uh, items. Uh, firstly, in the unlikely event that there's an emergency, if you can all make your way to the rear door that you came through, that'd be terrific. Uh, also, um, lunch for all our guests is at 12.30 today downstairs. Uh, and I think yesterday, for those who were in various sessions, we talked about the uh, Tesla cars. There's one down in the ground floor if you're all interested in checking one out. So please take advantage of that. Uh, and for lunch at 12.30, it is at the concept store. So it is on the ground floor. Uh, if you got, get lost, just ask uh, concierge. So uh, as I said, I have the pleasure of hosting this session. Uh, thank you again for your attendance this morning. Uh, I'd like to remind you we're, we're running a very, very interactive session. So we've got lots of various forms of social media. If you could uh, have a look on the screen, we're shortly going to put some up, but definitely you can find us at hashtag Amplify2017. So look forward to seeing you or hearing from you, I should say. That'd be great. Um, and I'll shortly be introducing our speaker. Uh, Michael's joining us and he's talking about uh, the edge of customer insights and is an understanding choice when machines are smarter than you. After the presentation, we're going to have time for Q&A. Uh, and uh, Michael uh, has uh, given me a KPI of at least two questions from the audience. Uh, so please don't let me down. Looking forward to hearing from you. Um, Michael, I'll hand over to you shortly, but just very quickly. Uh, Michael is one of the most uh, provocative thought leaders on innovation. He's an advisor to MIT's Security Studies Program and also uh, consults to the US government on national security systems innovation. So um, welcome, Michael. Hi, good morning. Thank you very much, Lisa. I'd like to thank uh, AMP and the Amplify people for inviting me back. It's a genuine pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, I, when I last spoke, I was talking about a book that I'd finished, Who Do You Want Your Customers to Become? And today we're really going to talk about uh, my research, ongoing research. Um, so aspects of this talk are, are rough, but my goal and hope and expectation is you're going to find it useful as well as interesting. I did a, did a little switch on the title, not just customer experience, user experience. I wanted to give you a broader perspective and a broader sense of this. And the key element is in the subtitle here, understanding choice when your machines are smarter than you are. What does choice mean when the devices you use to become more effective, to become more successful, to make choices? How does it affect your agency, your ability to choose. This is my most important slide. The content of the audience is more important than the content of the talk. Um, as, as Lisa mentioned explicitly, I'm very interested in your reactions to what I'm going to be saying and presenting this morning. Just by way of context, my background is computer science and economics. The work that I do at MIT pretty much focuses on the co-evolution of innovation and human capital and my Serious background is the behavioral economics of experimentation and, or, and innovation in organizations. And I look at the models, prototypes, and simulations that organizations build to manage innovation and risk. What kind of experiments, what kind of insights do models, prototypes, and simulations, be they physical or quantitative, do they use? How do people and individuals and organizations invest in models, prototypes, and simulations to manage innovation and risk? And over the last 20 years, my work has fundamentally flipped 180 degrees. The very first work I did was on collaboration. Watson and Crick, Brock and Picasso, Wilbur and Orville Wright. And I looked at how can people create more valuable innovation? How can people collaborate? How can people use tools and technologies to create more valuable innovation? And as I looked over the last four, five, six years, I, think, I see that things have flipped. 
I'm more interested now in how can innovation create more valuable people. How does innovation transform human capital? That's pretty much the schwerpunkt, the center of gravity of my research and work. So, at MIT last week, we held, the Sloan School held, the CIO Symposium. And the opening panel uh, featured a gentleman who's the CIO of GE, General Electric. I think you'd agree that's a fairly large and diversified company. And he said something that resonated with a lot of the work that I did and upset the audience greatly, which is why I presented for you, to you here. We're moving to a world where machines are going to tell people what to do instead of we tell the machines what to do. And in fact, that's who GE is hiring for. They have to hire for people who will do what the machines tell them to do. That's absolutely key. GE is going to be run by a co-evolution, by a collaboration between man and machine. And that sort of raises an interesting and obvious question, particularly in a company that is confronting technology such as, say, robo-advisors. You know, this changes the nature of, future, of uh, the future of personal and professional choice. That's what this talk is about. Now we have machines that are going to be telling us what to do. This is the challenge. Is algorithmic obedience the future of choice and your choice in the future? Is compliance to the algorithm, adherence to the algorithm, pretty much the definition of success for you and the way that you will be ranked? I want to explore in depth how people, how individuals and organizations are going to collaborate and work with and get value from and with their algorithms. Who really chooses and why? Who really chooses and why? That's going to be the core of what we're going to be discussing in the next 30 plus minutes. This is the most important thing I need you to understand as this talk goes forward. You are not you. You think you're you, you're not you. There's very good research, which we will be discussing shortly, that shows that who you think you are and your patterns of consistency of behavior really is not nearly as consistent as you might think your colleagues or bosses might think. I won't take the liberty of saying what your spouses and children might think. But the notion of who you are, psychology and very serious research indicates, is, shall we say, problematic. What we're going to explore this morning is the role that technology can and should play in helping identify, manage, and improve people's, your own, multiple selves multiple selves. I'm going to argue my case is this is where the world is going. The global future of consumer and workplace choice, what choice means, rests on how you all in the future create, lead, and manage multiple selves. Not self-management, multiple selves. And my call to action, and we'll detail this at the end, is how do you thoughtfully invest in AI? Not the AI you've been hearing about in the last day, artificial intelligence, but what I'm going to call augmented introspection. How does technology facilitate and enable augmented introspection so that you get a better grasp of that self that is making choices? Let's begin with a real world specific research example from a friend, colleague, who's now at UCLA, was with, at NYU, Hal Hirschfeld. Okay? He's very interested in the notion of a self called the future self. Who you are going to, assuming you're going to be around in 10 or 20 years, what is the relationship between you and yourself in 20 years? And because psychologists don't have necessarily big research budgets, he asked people to draw circles about the relationship between their current self and their future self. To what extent does it overlap? To what extent are they distinct? OK? All right. Then he did something very interesting, very provocative, and something that I think is directly relevant to virtually everybody here at AMP. 
he would take a picture of the subject, run it through an image aging processor so that they could see a, literally see a version of themselves 20 years in the future. Why? Because he's trying to create a connection between the current self and the future self. Seriously, what portion of your clients have mobile phones that can take pictures? All of them. Would they send a picture for image aging for this? For your retirement products and just for their soup for your super products on this. Okay? Do clients for free. Would they want to see representations of their future self? This talk about an on-point issue. This is from Hal's uh, uh, paper. To people estranged from their future selves, saving is like a choice between spending money today and giving it to a stranger years from now. Guess what the research discovered? To the extent that people had a closer relationship with their perceived future self, they would save more. The average saving percent was north of 35%. Being in closer touch with your future self, your perceived future self, changes your current behavior. The lesson is anything we can do that will increase how concrete and salient our future self is can help us make better decisions, exercise different choices. So I am not just some American flying in here to say, you need to pay more attention to your customers. The question I'm asking you is, how are you putting your customers and clients in a better position to understand and connect with themselves and their futures? I'm, I just scraped this off the net. Why am I doing this? Because five years ago, I couldn't. These are sites where right now, for, for very little sums of money, they will age your picture. We'll do it now, for free, or a couple of bucks. Okay? This technology all exists. Not only does it all exist, it all exists in an economically relatively cheap way. Our ability to do this is up to us. It is a, no pun intended, a choice. One of the key themes that I came away from listening to all the talks yesterday is, and, and I was struck by this, I really was struck by this. Virtually all the essential technologies exist for doing what we're talking about here. What I will like, would like to call selvesware. It, we can do it. You can do it. But it's a matter of changing your point of view on this. Because the great frustration I feel and observe is that I believe that we're not creating the right choices around creating the right choices. We are not using technology in a way that really facilitates helping our clients and customers gain actionable insight, actionable introspection into themselves. We use things like apps to amplify existing competencies. We have Amazon Alexa that we say, Alexa, play a song, play a happy song. I understand that Google Home is coming to Australia in the next six or seven weeks. We, we heard yesterday, in fact, I was on a panel on it, but other people talked about it. We have all manner of bots that can automate and augment and perform tasks that we ask them to do. We've got chat bots. We've got a company like GitHub that, that offers a bot, Hubot, that allows software developers to automate essential things and remove pain in the ass kind of programming and coding tasks and automate them. Okay? There are all manner of bots that we can delegate to. There are all manner of digital assistants that can help us accomplish the tasks we wish to have. Everybody here knows Siri. There are organizations now, and I'm, I'm putting the URLs here to show, this is not speculative, this exists. These are accessible resources. There's an open source Siri that developers or programmers here could do to build assistance-oriented software and services. We have agents and avatars that allow some sort of digital presence in networks and virtual environments. We have, indeed, software and network agents. You know, these are sort of the typology here that are designed 
sometimes with machine learning and AI, to do a better job of doing our bidding. But are bots, apps, agents, assistants, and avatars the right design, the best design, the best organizing principle for doing this? Should tasks and decisions be the key unit of analysis for us? I'm saying, and my research says, no. No. We should look at ourselves as the unit of analysis that we want to augment and enhance. Becoming more effectively introspective is going to be the maximal point and opportunity for leverage in making better choices and becoming more valuable. This is the key critical discriminator about selves as an organizing principle. Agents perform tasks to deliver desired outcomes. Selves define the tasks and the desired outcomes. I believe that people's future, the better ROI, is not how do we come up with a better, smarter bot or agent, but how do we come up with better and smarter selves that do a better job of reflecting who we want, what we want to accomplish so that we can get that bot or agent to deliver on that task. There are multiple definitions of what is a self. I'm not going to read all of these things to you, and you'll be able to have access to the, to the slides afterwards. But the point here is the organizing principle and unit of analysis that you want to think about is not, ooh, a bot does this, Alexa does that, Siri will do this or won't do that. No. The issue is who is telling or asking these agents and bots what to do? You are. My challenge, which you is telling them what to do? If you look, I'm not a psychologist. One of the great things about doing this was get, doing all manner of research on this. But there's all manner of models and metaphors for the mind and the self that can be used to design better software selves, augmented software selves. We have the Freudian model of id, superego, and ego. I, I'm, by the way, for those of you on the religious side, I'm completely fine with spirituality, but it's not what I'm good at, and I don't want to make religious presentations. So I'm just going to stick with good old-fashioned philosophy and psychology here. You have the mind and self-history, you have the Stoics, Epictetus and Tacitus. What does a good life mean? What does wisdom mean? We have Descartes, the mind-body issue. You have Herb Simon, bounded rationality, uh, um, satisficing versus optimizing. You see an asterisk there. You have Tom Schelling, just passed away from Harvard. Uh, wonderful, uh, uh, the a wonderful article called "The Intimate Contest for Demand, uh, for Command." Uh, he coined the phrase egonomics. He talks about self-control, the economics of self-control. Also an asterisk by his name, Marvin Minsky, also sadly passing away, wrote a book which we'll come to in a moment. He was a pioneer in, in artificial intelligence. He was at the Media Lab at MIT. I had the good opportunity to work with him. We have Daniel Kahneman, one uh, again asterisk. Thinking Fast and Slow, and uh, Michael Lewis's book, The Undoing Project, just came out. Terrific book. You really want to understand the issues, the history of the issues that I'm discussing this morning, you want to look at The Undoing Project. I, I was in Dimex, saw it. It's good. Okay. What do all these asterisks have in common? Nobel laureates. Okay. How economists and how psychologists have looked at the mind is going to be our source of design inspiration for constructing better selves. The key insight from Marvin Minsky's book almost 30 years ago, Society of Mind, was that the human mind consists not of a self, but is of a series of interacting modules. You know, there are different kinds of modules. There's the flight or f fight or flight module. There's the mathematics module. There's the heuristics module. This is the thinking fast and slow from Daniel Kahneman. But, but basically, there is no coherent structure of the mind. 
there's no consistent self. This guy I saw him in uh, um, University of Pennsylvania the other week in his article, Modularity in the Social Mind. Robert Kurzban edits the journal on evolutionary psychology. About a decade ago, one of the most cited articles, are psychologists too selfish? Do they focus too much on the self when they should be focusing on the modules that make up the mind that actually express temperament and make the decision. And this is the nicest summary of where I'm coming from here, from Jonathan Haidt at NYU. We assume there is one person in each body, but in some ways we are more like a committee whose members have been thrown together working at cross purposes. In other words, it depends the mood of our committee <laughs> and who's present at the meeting and who's left. And sometimes what do co committees do? They table things. You know, sometimes committees make the wrong decision. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's horrible on, on this. We feel conflicted and confused. It's not an accident. That's the way our minds have evolved. Okay. This is, the, a, 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 you know, there's controversy on this, but this is a very, very serious and actionable way to view one's self, or more accurately, one's selves. That's the global search and replace I want you to consider. Stop thinking of you as you. Stop thinking of yourself as a self. Wherever you see the word self, substitute the word selves. Here's the little Gedanken experiment. Instead of self-awareness, I want to encourage you to consider selves awareness. Instead of self-control, you're practicing selves control. Any of you who's gone on a diet or exercise know exactly what I'm talking about in this regard. We talk about self-discipline, rubbish. It's selves discipline. Self-management, no. Selves management. You've heard of the quantified self. We're going to be talking about quantified selves. All right? The unit of analysis should not be the self. It should be the selves that shape us. I'm blabbing about this. Here's my operational definition. A multiple self is a version of the self with one or more key attributes profoundly changed along a purposeful dimension. OK? It's a module that gets amplified or attenuated. OK? And this is the challenge. When we face a decision in our personal lives, in consumption, in our business lives, and production, which selves should be making what choices and why? How do we align the right selves with the right opportunity? OK? Being your best self is exactly the wrong thing to be. What are the appropriate selves that you want to deal with? Let me give you a nice, simple heuristic in this regard. Everybody in this room knows the Pareto principle. 20% of the things are, you know, generate 80% of the outcomes. Look to, let's begin this augmented introspection. What are your Pareto selves? What 20% of your interactions generate the best outcomes for you? What 20% of yourself generates the worst outcomes for you? If you were to look at yourself as a, co a collection of attributes and attitudes and aspects, what are the Pareto elements and attributes that account for your productivity, effectiveness, selves, destructiveness, etc.? That's what you want to begin to design around. So while many people preach the virtues, I'll be slightly controversial, while many people preach the virtues of mindfulness, and, oh, we need to become more holistic. I'm here to say rubbish. Being holistic represents a corruption and compromise rather than the approach on focusing on the Pareto selves that generate the best result. Being a holistic self is, to connect the metaphor, like having a committee with too many people on it and the wrong people on the committee. Too diverse, too many, too much, doesn't scale. What's the difference between today and a decade ago? 
in this conversation. It's simple, it's obvious, it's literally or figuratively in the palm of your hand. For this gentleman, it's the palm of his right hand, it's his phone. He's got a cup of coffee in his other one. Okay? Although coffee should not be ignored in terms of selves management either. Okay? We're all cyborgs. We're all cyborgs. We all depend on technology in this regard. Our best workers, our best partners, our clients, our customers are becoming cyborgs. He's a cyborg. He, he has a much more difficult life, and he's certainly not productive unless he has access to technology. To go the other extreme, she's a cyborg. Okay? I mean, this woman doesn't exist without the internet. Okay? Although I do have to say, we were joking about this at MIT, so I'd like to share this joke with you. It would be a fun job to be Kim Kardashian West's data scientist. You know, you, you, you figure you know, that there, there's interesting data there to be mined, you know. <laughs> and and uh, we won't talk about image processing for the time being on this. Okay? So when you look at a book like Laszlo Buck, which is an excellent book, by the way, uh, the former people uh, VP at, at Google, we're not talking about people analytics anymore. We're talking about cyborg analytics. We're talking about how do we quantify and measure people's performance and the, or the choices they make in the workplace. And this leads to the notion of what's the future of data and analytics? What's the future of desired outcomes? What's the future of the self? And I'm going to argue that where we want to be, of course, it's the Venn diagram, we want to be in the intersection of this. Selves management is how do we de decide, how do we figure out the appropriate intersection between all the data we're going to have access to, the outcomes that matter to us or the people who employ us, and, and the self. Which self? The relevant self for delivering that desired outcome. Well, I'll just spend a little bit of time on the data. Just how many of you have Fitbits or devices in this regard? Excellent. So you're doing this. You're already doing the quantified self in the fitness way. All right? I'm going to say with, with no fear of contradiction at all that in terms of me data, it's what, 2017 now? If you are not generating and ideally tracking between 10 to 100 times more data by the middle of 2019, you are doing something wrong. You are doing something wrong. The question isn't, though, how much more data are you managing? It's how are you getting value from that data? That's the real issue. So the whole theme of the quantified self is how do we get value from this? And I'm going to say, so this, how many of you have a KPI dashboard, not for AMP or another company, how many of you have a KPI dashboard for yourself on your phone? This gentleman does. One, he's one of a kind. I want you to see him after on, on this and see, see how this is going. But, but the reality is there's one gentleman, a couple of people put their hands up. It's got to be over half of you in the next two to three years. Or else, and we saw this stuff on exponential stuff, or else it means you're not doing the things you want to do to be more productive and effective because you're not taking advantage of the data that you have. OK? Should you have a personal productivity dashboard? How should it be shared? at an AMP or a company. Now, let's talk about this. Well, I have a dashboard on the aggregate, but what about my various me's, my Pareto selves, the persuasive self, the project manager self, the compliance self? Should each of your Pareto selves have its own personal productivity dashboard? I think the future we're headed to is multiple dashboards for multiple selves. Because we're already managing multiple selves anyway, and it's how do we do so effectively, constructively, and helpfully. Simple, simple heuristics. You know the book, The Checklist Manifesto? OK? Simple self-management. Wonderful book by Atul Gawande. Go to checklists.com. Right? So most of you have laptops, PCs, your tracking work. What if you had generated in the morning, you come to work or w before you go to work, your checklist? Machine learning AI program generates your checklist. 
we can begin to put different attributes on that. Here's the checklist if you want to be most productive. Here's the checklist if you want to impress your boss. Here's the checklist. Don't laugh at that. You want to impress the boss. Here's the checklist for having an impact on our best clients. Here's the checklist for growing the business. Here's the checklist for cost reduction. Those are different modules. Those are different aspects of you. Those are different bits of aspect. Okay? This technology exists. Amazon recommendation engines, Netflix recommendation engines. What's the recommendation engine for you? What's the recommendation engine for you and for which selves? Again, all these technologies exist. You're now gathering more data. You've been hearing about these machine learning and AI algorithms. These things need to be packaged and integrated. This is what I'm putting together. This is what I'm research that I'm doing at MIT. So how many of you use Gmail by any chance? Excellent. So you'll be familiar with this. Gmail is now exploring, uh, Google is now exploring, Alphabet, is now exploring inbox recommenders. Here's another thought experiment w with your Gmail. Before you send out an email, who else should be copied? OK? It makes recommendations for who else should be copied if to make you look smart. You want to look smart. Again, why is this funny? You don't want to look smart? <laughs> to make your boss look good. Ah, the political manipulator. I want to be more liked in the organization. Again, I don't know why people are laughing here. These are not jokes. To get constructive feedback to advance the interest of another project? You do have a political agenda? If you have access to the data, if the organization is sharing data, you will be able to have, yourselves will be able to have recommendations on who that email should be sent to. Ah, are you expressing things in the right way? Go online, check out IBM Watson's Tone Analyzer. It does sentiment analysis on email. So you can see, are you being an obnoxious jerk with the email that you send? Should you be using softer language? OK? It highlights these things. Again, this isn't three or four year old speculation. This exists. You can trial this now. You can check it out by the, do it while I'm giving this talk. OK? We talk about software as a service. And I met one of your technical gentlemen the other, uh, yesterday at a meeting and you're replatforming around Salesforce. Maybe this becomes a Salesforce offering. Attribute analyzer and amplifier as a service. Okay? Amazon could offer it. We hear the gentleman from Slack leveraging these platforms. All of these things could be done. We want to improve the quality of chat, improve the quality of the Microsoft Outbox, you know, Microsoft Server. The infrastructure for enterprise computing, should the role of enterprise, be compu uh, enterprise computing not just be to support your individual productivity, but to enable you to manage a portfolio of productive selves. At the same time, flip it for your customers. Use your experience. Do your customers. Well, we'll come to that in a moment. We'll come to that in a moment. So I want to stress, as I mentioned with the IBM Tone Analyzer, it's not just about being effective, it's affective. It's about being effectively effective and effectively affective. How do we marry tone and substance? We now have the crap loads of data that allow us to do this. We now have the algorithms to do that. Here's what we, we, we now have the ability to use technology to be introspective about how we produce and how we consume. And companies like Amazon and Netflix have done very, very well observing our behaviors and making recommendations based on that kind of data. So the practical challenge I would ask is, which multiple self would you choose to improve your workplace productivity over the next six months? Okay, But let's flip it to the customer side, as I was alluding to a few moments ago. Everybody in this room knows about robo-advisors. What are we trying to do? We're trying to improve. AMP, goal-oriented. How do we have robo-advisors to deliver to a goal? My argument is going to be, you don't want a robo-advisor to treat clients as individuals. You want, as you do with the, the aging client, okay? you want the robo-advisor to advise future selves, the client future selves. I guarantee you, 
the client is going to respond differently if they see a different picture, literally a different picture of themselves. What does my risk averse self look like versus my risk prone self? What about being in a couple versus on my own? How do we use robo advisors to allow the client to manage a portfolio of their own multiple selves that gives them insight into them that allows you to connect with them and help them better understand not themselves, but themselves. Recommendations for happy selves, sad selves. By the way, this is a true story. I'm at a conference with the guy from, from um, Amazon who does Alexa. The Alexa gets a lot of requests for music. Play me a sad song. Okay, here is a billion dollar question that Amazon is now testing. I'm not speaking out of school here. He said this at a conference in New York a few months ago. He said they're now debating whether to ask people how sad they are or to do analysis of the tone and select recommendations based on the, the tone of the person saying, play me a sad song. Okay, that's a huge decision. But these tone analyzers exist and Amazon is spending a lot on them. So while this is hypothetical in, in June of 2017, it'll be an announcement by this time next year. Okay? Maybe you're a sucker. What about recommendations for curious and skeptical selves? What if you want to be edgy on this? I mentioned Herb Simon. Good enough versus optimize. Maximizers versus satisficers. Satisficers. You've got a lot of stuff on your plate. You want a recommendation that says, what's the minimum amount of work I can do to satisfy all these requirements? Versus, this is where I have to step up. How do I optimize around these variables? Those are different selves. Those are different motivations. It gets a little complicated now because you're going to be able to audit the ratio between doing good enough versus optimizing. And depending upon your company, your company may be observing that ratio too. Okay? You want to become more persuasive. You all know Facebook and Slack, the social graph. Well, we can analyze the sentiment. We can analyze the texts. We can analyze the conversation. What kind of words are people more receptive to or more persuaded by? We'll craft our communications accordingly on this. All right? You may become, as you prepare that presentation, as you prepare that report, you're going to run it through a tone analyzer or a recommender that says, I am trying to persuade this group of people. How should I structure this information? How should I structure my argument to be maximally persuasive based on these known readers? That's a different self. You choose that. You choose that, OK? Maybe you want to have people like you, your boss really, really like you. So you have the sycophancy recommender. What does it mean to really suck up to your boss? Your technology will let you know on, on, on this regard. And if you become too much of a sycophant, you know, you'll get feedback from the boss, and it'll be incorporated in there. Maybe you are accused of not being creative enough on things. Well, check out Neural Doodle. Didn't exist five years ago. Now it's on GitHub for free. And what does it do? You make a doodle and it transforms it, transforms sketches and doodles into Surah type impressionist art. There are other genres of art. Okay, this is visual. We could do this with architectural engineering drawings, and a variety of things. There's another one called Inceptionism. Again, URL, not hypothetical. It exists. And it's sort of like a mashup. There's the fruit salad. There's the, what is this, Mondrian? Who is this? Is it Mondrian? Who is it? Picasso? OK. I'll, I'll, I'll take your word on, on, on the Picasso. And here we have a Picasso-fied fruit salad. Because it's the internet, I'm going to do something, and you should feel free to hiss. It's a cat. OK? We have the cat mashup. Here's the, what is, I've, 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 I know this is one of the impressionists. 
but that's the impressionified cat. I'm not doing this for the cat's purposes. What we can do? We can do mashups of at levels of abstraction. They can be visual. They can be acoustic. They can be textual. It depends on how you train the software, the AI. One last cat. <laughs> okay. Again, not hypothetical. And unlike the stuff you saw yesterday, this is not going to cost you a million dollars, half a million dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, or even a thousand dollars. Okay. This is stuff you can do now, if you want. This is a creativity amplifier. And I just mentioned machine learning earlier. These are the algorithms that are diffusing. These are the things that are going to convert data and desirable outcomes themselves into something that is economic and distributable. All the essential selvesware technologies exist. It all exists. I don't think we've gone down the wrong road by focusing on bots, avatars, agents, and assistants. I think we haven't gone far enough down the selvesware road as well. What does portfolio management of multiple selves mean? How will organizations enforce or encourage compliance to the kinds of multiple selves they want you to be at work, or the kind of multiple selves they want your clients to become? This is the virtuous selves cycle I encourage you to consider. How do selves, new selves, lead to different kinds of data and analytics that can lead to more desired outcomes? Ah, we have these kinds of desired outcomes. Which aspects of ourselves and what kind of data should support that? We have this kind of data. What kind of new selves does this permit that can lead to more effective and desired outcomes? We don't manage these things separately. We use digital media platforms to transform introspection so that we can creatively and effectively manage and create multiple selves. Since we're the business, you're a boss, should you be able to impose a multiple self on a direct report? You need to be more creative. I want you to design a multiple self, a self that helps you be more creative. That's going to be one of the ways I evaluate you as an employee. Or I need you to be more responsive. Okay? Here's the multiple self that generates the prods and prompts and cues for you to behave appropriately. How would you respond to your boss pushing you to create a multiple self? Would you be happy that your boss took that level of interest in you? Or would you feel that you're becoming a wage slave in that regard? That's a hypothetical question now. I'm still old enough, and I'm, forgive me for saying this, many or most of you in the audience as well. It used to be you didn't have mobile phones, so you couldn't be called all the time. <laughs> That's the new expectation. I think having multiple cells may be the same kind of expectation as having a phone with you and being accessible all the time. Okay? That's Peter Drucker. I think the question for AMP management and global man by the way, imagine India and China with a billion people and their smartest people each having multiple selves. Wow, talk about global competition. I think this is what the future of enterprise looks like. I think this is what the future of markets look like. How will tomorrow's high performance organizations create high performance teams of multiple selves. Multiple selves managing multiple bots. With apologies to Talos, know thyself, we're moving into an environment where you need to know thyself. Okay? That's the future of choice. And this, let's put it all on a t-shirt. People don't buy better products, they buy better versions of themselves. How are you investing in technology that allows people to choose to create better versions of themselves. I think that's where the future is going. All the technical ingredients and organizational ingredients are here. Those are my remarks. That's the current status of my work. I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, so I caught up with Michael yesterday and I uh, had the pleasure of 
talking in a bit more detail about his work, absolutely fascinating. So uh, let's use this opportunity to um, pick Michael's brain. Um, so if you do have a question, we've got a couple of roving mics, so just raise your hand, uh, say your name, where you're from, and um, ask away, and then we'll I just I just want to say that this is not my high performance self, this is just my performance self yeah. that will be answering the question. Terrific. Question? Yes. You're very kind. I'm Jeff Susan with Andy, and I'm very aware of multiple selves. I've done the Enneagram, so I'm a seven. Ah, okay. So I mean, no, I'm an eight, seven, so I mean seven. Yeah. And I'm very aware of all the selves. So I have a question for Michael. Yes. Um, I'm a seven, and I'm very aware of all the selves. I've done the Enneagram, so I'm a seven. So I mean, no, I'm an eight, seven, so I mean seven. So my question is, talking to you, speaking to my work as a user researcher, how do you want me to view the research, researching multiple selves? That is a great question. Um, let me give you, I'll, I'll, I'll exchange some of the, share with you some of the information I had when I talked with Hal Hirschfeld on this. Some people, I'll, I'll go with a very dramatic example first from medicine. Um, as you know, there are genetic tests that will tell you with a higher probability whether you're going to get certain kinds of cancers or Alzheimer's, etc. Many people, when they are given the option to take such a test, test decline. Many people who are given the option to have a picture of their future self, they don't want to see it. If you're doing it as a couple, you may not want to see what your partner may be looking like in 20 years. Okay? There are all manner of issues here. So the first thing I would, segmentation I would consider is, do people want to know about their future selves? Because there are tools for that. Do they want to? And that becomes a segment. No. They don't want to know about their future selves. You're going to do user experience. You're, the user experience for somebody who cares more about the short term is going to be different than somebody who really is thinking about who and what they are a decade or 20 years hence. So that becomes an important, right there you have an important discriminator. Is this person in touch or want to be in touch with their future self? Then as a user experience designer, you say, what tools can I give people? We talked about the image progression thing. There's something else that Hal and other psychologists have done, which is you write a letter from yourself in the future. You ask the person to assume a persona from a certain perspective. What would you say, what would you say, what, 20 years from now, what would you want to say to yourself? You know, what kind of note would you want to write? Efforts made to, and by the way, some people don't want to do that, okay? It's not expensive to do. Some people don't want, they, it's too stressful for them. There's cognitive dissonance. Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying look for fast, cheap, and simple tools to test how interested people are in being introspective. Some people are incredibly not just introspective. That, I think this will do very well with narcissists. But I, I, I think there are a lot of people who are fascinated to learn more about themselves. And they've never really done Some of these people go into therapy, etc. I think if I'm, if I'm a user experience designer, I want to be seen as somebody, I want, you want people leaving an interaction with you saying, you know, I now think about myself differently. I'm, I'm more self-aware about what I want after this user experience design session for this. I think that's going to be one of the ways UX designers are going to rebrand themselves. So you, good user experiences, and by the way, you, I'm, I'm going on too long, but you're dealing with use cases. You're dealing with use cases in different times of day. So you're dealing with different aspects of people's selves. So UX people are already two thirds to three quarters of the way there. I'm only asking you to go another one third or you know, 25% to what you're already doing in this regard. Long-winded answer, but I hope it, 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 it's a start. Uh, hi, Michael. Peter from the technology team at AMP. Ah, great. Uh, I was wondering how we might be able to cheaply or easily pilot the concept of cells within AMP. Um, if you were doing it for internally, um, I would, I would, the first thing I would do is I'd find out how many people here self-quantify. Then I would look at whatever the workplace analytics roadmap is and then begin to marry the two, okay, and say, do you want to become more efficient on these dimensions? So you leverage the existing platforms and create an option for, is there a particular aspect that you want to optimize around or change? And so you sort of seductively move into it. 
But if you want to do it on the, on the consumer side, I'll, I'll be very blunt. I know you have a direct mobile service. You ask, you put a button on there and said, would you like to see what you look like 20 years from now? How, by the way, just a show of hands. How many people here believe for free that, that half or more of your customers, and we'll pick millennials, right? Because if you're 55, you'd really you know, have a different attitude. If you're, if you're between 30 and 40, how many people here believe that over half of the people would want to see a future image of themselves? See, by the way, that's a very interesting number. I, I, you know what my bet is? I have no clue. I have no clue. I think there are going to be different cultural tests. But what's the common thing, and this goes back to the speech we heard yesterday, this is an experiment. I think the best way to begin is what kind of experiments can we do that are cheap and that we, are lear that we would learn a lot? Okay. I, and here's one confident thing I'm going to say. I believe people who would want to see an image of their future self are going to behave differently and be open to advice differently than people who don't. Might have time for one more question. No? Well, you hit the KPI of two. There's this a third it. over there. Good. I've got a bonus writing yeah, on this one. Hi, um, Jane Hawkins, also from Technology. Great. Um, my question is probably a little more social media oriented. Great. <laughs> um, what about Facebook? Like, couldn't you already create like a persona, like extra personas on Facebook I if you wanted so to? I am so glad you asked that question. First, in the interest of full disclosure, my brother works at Facebook, and I think this is a multi-billion-dollar idea for for Facebook, which even Facebook would take seriously. I do not. Quick show of hands. How many of you are on Facebook? Great. If you had the option to say, here's my adventuresome self on Facebook, or here's my curious self, here's an aspect of myself that I would, would adjust the feed for and the messenger for, I think Facebook could literally quadruple or quintuple its presence. And this would lead to more targeted and focused advertising. But it would also be an interesting way for you to discover how often do you check in with your adventuresome self? as opposed to your ordinary or typical self, or your want-to-have-fun self, as opposed to your drab, dreary, everyday existence self. You know? so, so there are all manner of ways this could be done. So I do not know. They're very big on self, you know, connected. But I believe that a future of Facebook, I believe that a future of all social networks is the option to create and manage not multiple identities, multiple selves with aspects and attributes that are amplified so that people can literally see what they would be like if they were different in certain ways. Fascinating. All right, we're out of time. Thank you again. Please join me. It's my pleasure. Thank, Thank you so you much. Mike.